a new superpower is emerging with a human rights record amongst the worst in the world, the People's Republic of China. In case you need reminding, it's a regime with over one million of its citizens in concentration camps because they don't conform to the ideals of the dictatorship, including their religion. Those of other religions are held as prisoners of conscience, and as the China Tribunal under Sir Geoffrey Nice QC has shown, these people are killed for their organs for transplant. China has ripped up an international agreement and persecutes pro-democracy elements while militarizing islands which it has illegally taken. Aside from this internal brutal ugliness and expansion of its military footprint, the regime has also been pursuing soft diplomacy. The brutal internal repression is about keeping the regime in power and in control. The military might is designed to intimidate. The soft diplomacy is about changing the world order without the use of military force. And chief in its arsenal of soft diplomacy is the insidious BRI, Belt and Road Initiative. Its purpose, allow a retired People's Liberation Army Major General Kuo Lang to explain. It's about providing a vehicle for China to achieve dominance over the United States, bringing about a new form of globalization in which the Chinese currency displaces the US dollar to hollow out the US. With that, the Chinese dream, as outlined by Xi Jinping, to regain their place as a superpower can be realized. It's unthinkable that a democratically elected government would enter into an agreement with such a brutal regime, but that is exactly what the Victorian Labor government deliberately, willfully, and stupidly undertook. Make no mistake, this deal has broad ramifications. First, it undermines our Commonwealth government as the sole custodian of matters of foreign affairs. Secondly, it provides propaganda value, not just back home in China, but legitimizes the initiative to other countries they are seeking to lure into their debt trap. So what is the Belt and Road Initiative? In 2013, Xi Jinping unveiled the initiative. Metaphorically based on the historic Silk Trade, road trade routes that connected the East and West. The BRI is a global infrastructure development strategy to create an international trade route that connects China to the world. The BRI will re revive the ancient Silk Road as a modern transit trade and economic corridor, covering a population of 4.4 billion people and an expected economic output of 21 trillion. Belt is short for Silk Road Economic Belt, referring to the proposed overland routes for rail and road transportation through Central Asia along the famed history reaching its destination in Europe. The first step is to link Central Asia to the Chinese economy, while the longer distance initiatives include railway connections between China and Europe. The Belt Initiative also calls for the integration of the Eurasian landmass into a cohesive economic area. Road is short for the 21st century maritime Silk Road, referring to the Indo-Pacific sea routes through South and Southeast Asia to Africa and the Middle East. The road is the plan for China's development of ports and economic hubs across the Indo-Pacific. The purchase and construction of port facilities and associated economic zones in countries as diverse and distant from one another, including, but not limited to, Australia, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Pakistan, and Tanzania, are intended to provide China with maritime access and economic benefit across the Indian Ocean. These will connect to Piraeus, Greece's major port, and bought by Chinese shipping group Costco, which will allow direct access to the markets of Europe. China claims that the BRI will include 65 countries, 4.4 billion people, and about 40% of global GDP. China has reportedly thus far established 75 overseas economic and trade cooperation zones in 35 countries. 
The vast majority of the VRI involves PRC state-owned enterprises and is funded through significant loans provided by China's policy banks and their other financial institutions. Their aim? To rival the IMF and WTO. The debts imposed on vulnerable partner countries through these projects have been criticised as debt diplomacy, with Sri Lanka needing to grant China a 99-year lease on its port to cover its debts. China also uses its massive financial assets to dominate smaller economies through long-term control of infrastructure, natural resources and associated land assets, and through offering poor credit terms for infrastructure loans. The CCP positions the BRI as an economic initiative sold to the world in the spirit of mutually beneficial cooperation. Yet the BRI is far from a benign exercise in economic goodwill. It is both an economic and strategic program. China portrays BRI as both premised on and further validating China's claims to the islands of the South China Sea, while on the other side of the Indian Ocean, Djibouti is providing China with both a trade port as well as its first overseas military base. It is repeatedly noted in China that the BRI is also intended as a regional security mechanism and the future role of the People's Liberation Army in protecting China's BRI facilities abroad has been widely discussed. China predicates its longer term aims on the BRI, creating a Eurasia-wide, China-led economic bloc to counter the US. In 2016, at the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore, the director of the then-named Centre of One Belt and One Road Studies, Professor Jiang Langzin, spoke of the BRI as a path to a, quote, post-Westphalian world, end of quote. The BRI's broad geographic scope extends over remote regions where the security situation can be volatile due to political instability, social unrest and religious extremism, potentially putting at risk the safety of a growing number of Chinese businesses, workers and assets. It is in the South Pacific that Australia has perhaps most noticed China's BRI expansion through aid, trade, loans, tourism, industry, police, military, educational and other engagements, China has begun to challenge the traditional partners of the region. Growing PRC engagement with Papua New Guinea, the Solomon Islands, Fiji, Vanuatu and Tonga has caused the most unease amongst Australian observers. These actions are also seen by many as part of a broader Chinese challenge to Western interests in the Western Pacific. Nadezhda Roland from the National Bureau of Asian Research notes, and I quote, on August the 1st, 2017, the day of its 90th anniversary, China's PLA officially inaugurated its first permanent overseas support facility under the blazing Djibouti and Sun. The event indicated a dramatic departure from the previously prevailing claim that China does not station any troops or set up any military bases in any foreign country as a matter of policy. It also highlighted the long-term role assigned to the PLA in protecting China's expanding national interests, a role that Hu Jintao had granted the Chinese military back in 2004 as part of its new historic missions. The 2015 Defence White Paper put an unprecedented emphasis on maritime interests and on the PLA's responsibility to protect them as one of its core missions, end of quote. It's clear why many nations view the BRI as a joint strategic and economic weapon of the CCP and one that poses a profound challenge to the stability of the global political and economic order. Despite this damning and well-known information, in 2016, the Victorian government foreshadowed its efforts to massively increase its economic links with China when it launched its China strategy. One of the three themes identified in Victoria's new approach to engaging China 
is that Victoria will build substantive and enduring connections with China at every level between our governments, including at the bilateral provincial level, businesses, communities and individuals. The strategy sees Victoria's total share of Chinese investment to Australia to increase from 8% to 20% by 2026, and the Victorian government to attract and facilitate $2 billion of Chinese investment into the state within the next 10 years. The 2018 Progress Report on Victoria's China strategy demonstrated that Victoria's share of investment from China into Australia has already reached 25%, exceeding the 10-year target in the strategy. Alarmingly, the Progress Report revealed how the China Investment Corporation joined the Lonsdale Consortium to purchase 20% of the 50-year-long Port of Melbourne lease. It was clear that the CCP had grander plans for Victoria when the Progress Report stated that the state's commitment was recognised when the Premier was the only state leader invited to the prestigious Belt and Road Forum in May 2017. Finally, three years after the BRI was first announced by Xi Jinping on the 8th of October 2018, the Victorian Government and China's National Development and Reform Commission signed a Memorandum of Understanding for the BRI in Victoria. Premier Andrews initially refused to release the MOU, only relenting after pressure. The MOU revealed an extreme lack of detail, making vague references about cooperation and promoting the Silk Road spirit, whatever that might mean. The drafting of the MOU and later framework agreement would be an embarrassment to any first, law year, first year law student. The only possible excuse is that it was written in Chinese and then poorly translated into English. For instance, the MOU doesn't even correctly characterise the parties. Allow me to quote, the government of the state of Victoria, Australia, hereinafter referred to as the parties, and the National Development and Reform Commission of the People's Republic of China. The section hereinafter referred to as the parties should clearly be placed after the reference to the NDRC of the People's Republic of China. Given that the parties refers only to Victoria, all the obligations in the MOU stating the parties commit themselves to undertaking certain activities applies only to Victoria. Inept, embarrassing, inexcusable, yet Premier Andrews willingly signed the document. The MOU refers to joint researchers rather than joint research, and so the inadequacy is exposed. The only redeeming feature is Article 5, Clause 5, which tells us the MOU does not create legal relations. Apart from drafting issues, concerns were raised over what rights Victoria had to, had to terminate the agreement, as it appears the MOU can only be terminated by mutual understanding. In October 2019, the Victorian government doubled down and signed a framework agreement on the BRI. The agreement puts forth several areas of cooperation, including attempts to involve more Chinese companies working on Victoria's 70 billion big build transport infrastructure construction program and for companies from the state to get work on BRI projects around the world. Like the MOU, the framework agreement is vague and bereft of detail, outlining how it will provide guidance for all round cooperation, describing itself as a coordination and engagement mechanism between Victoria and China. The framework sets forth in prose worthy of a counterfeit DVD, areas to adhere to the principles of business dominated, market oriented and government guided, and bring into play respective strengthens with a concept of openness whatever all that might mean. It is alarming that both sides 
agree to, quote, comply with international rules and respect laws of opposite country without ever specifying what laws of China that Victoria should respect, considering China has thousands of laws and uses laws to conduct mass surveillance on its citizens, forcibly harvest organs, and detain one million Uyghurs in concentration camps amongst numerous human rights abuses. It's most ironic that the last sentence in the overview of the framework of the agreement states that the Victorian government will consider both Victoria's and the national interest before agreeing to any specific activity. So for the purpose of this agreement, Victoria will determine the national interest, not the Commonwealth government. It was later revealed that no consultation occurred between the Victorian government and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade over the final framework agreement. This was despite early warnings from DFAT that it was not in Australia's foreign policy interest to sign up to the agreement. This reluctance to consult with DFAT on the framework agreement and release the MOU only after sustained pressure is indicative of a government that did not want scrutiny over these agreements. Similar to Premier Andrews, dynamic handling of COVID, the same skill, aptitude and competence appears to have been expended on the BRI. In early June 2020, Premier Andrews again doubled down and insisted that Victorian involvement with the BRI was still a good deal for the state despite continuing pressure, including from Federal Opposition Leader Anthony Albanese who said he would not sign Australia up for the BRI. Premier Andrews said that while, quote, we don't agree with China on everything, some may be happy to take their orders from, from Canberra, I'm not one of them. Clearly, he prefers Beijing. Given the ample evidence, even back in 2018, indicating the BRI was a threat to Australia's national security, the Victorian government's decision to sign an MOU and a framework agreement brought to the fore serious questions on the legal ramifications of a state government signing agreements that raised serious national security concerns and foreign policy considerations, both of which should fall squarely under the purview of the Commonwealth government. Commonwealth laws can apply to state governments and are override conflicting state laws. State executives can sign agreements, contracts, memorandum of understanding and the like by virtue of their nature as governments and legal entities. However, the Commonwealth may legislate where it has a head of power and states are then subject to Commonwealth laws as are their agreements and any matters under such agreements. In brief, each of the states is a sovereign state in its own right. They came together in an indissoluble commonwealth for certain purposes, one of which was external affairs. Even in these specific certain purposes, the states can act and legislate, if not in breach of commonwealth laws. So the Northern Territory, taking a hypothetical example, of course, could sell a port to a foreign interest in the absence of a federal law forbidding such a transaction. It may be noted that the Commonwealth's Foreign Investment Review Board guidelines now include a national interest test along with, other, with its other considerations designed to ensure the Commonwealth has greater oversight of such transactions which may impact our national interest. As an aside, the threshold to trigger FERB is now zero dollars. One trusts the Darwin port may not have been sold or technically leased if the current rules applied then. Section 109 of our constitution states simply and unambiguously that when a law of a state is inconsistent with the law of the Commonwealth, the latter shall prevail and the former shall, to the extent of the inconsistency, be invalid. The Commonwealth has little awareness of the foreign engagement by state and territory governments, public institutions such as universities, government departments or agencies with foreign governments and their associated entities. There is no existing mechanism or consistent practice 
to ensure that state or territory governments notify the Commonwealth of arrangements with foreign governments or consult and seek advice on the impact of such arrangements on Australia's foreign relations and national security. Due to the Commonwealth having no oversight of the thousands of arrangements Australian entities have with foreign entities and the sustained and unprecedented foreign interference experienced in Australia, the Commonwealth Government announced in August of this year it would legislate the Foreign Relations State and Territory Arrangements Bill 2020 to provide it with the necessary oversight and, if needed, veto power. The Foreign Relations Bill is a legislative scheme for Commonwealth engagement with arrangements between state or territory governments and foreign governments. The scheme will also cover entities that are associated with state or territory governments, such as local councils and Australian public universities and foreign governments, such as municipal or provincial governments. As empowered under Section 5129 of the Constitution, the Federal Parliament has the power to make laws with respect to external affairs. The framework of the Bill ensures that arrangements between state or territory governments and foreign governments and their associated entities do not adversely affect Australia's foreign relations and are not inconsistent with Australia's foreign policy. This is intended to foster a systematic and consistent approach to foreign engagement across all levels of Australian government. The framework to be established by this bill ensures that state and territory entities cannot negotiate, inter vary or continue to give effect to arrangements with foreign entities where the arrangement would adversely affect the Commonwealth's foreign relations or is inconsistent with the Commonwealth's foreign policy. Furthermore, whether an arrangement adversely affects Australian foreign relations or is inconsistent with Australia's foreign policy is a matter for the Minister to consider on a case-by-case -case basis. Therefore, even without considering the threat of the BRI, the text of the Bill gives near certainty that the BRI will fall under the scope of the Bill. The Commonwealth Government would then, if deemed necessary, have the capacity to terminate BRI arrangements and agreements entered into by the Victorian Government with China. The possibility of Victoria owing billions of dollars of debt to the CCP could result in devastating economic and strategic damage, not only for Victoria, but the nation, noting Victoria represents 25% of our nation's economy. The economic leverage alone of a foreign nation owning so much of a state's debt should have been sufficient grounds for ruling out any such deal. Yet, Victoria proceeded. The decision to pursue the BRI, despite all evidence pointing to its real nature as an instrument of foreign interference, warnings from DFAT and the example of other nations succumbing to debt trap diplomacy reveal the Victorian government is ignorant, willfully or otherwise, to the real motivations and the threat that the BRI poses. Having identified the problem and enacted some steps to mitigate the potential threat of the BRI in Australia, the question then is, what of the threat the BRI poses to the global community and how should Australia play its part to combat it? Don't worry, I'm not going to get a second win to answer that question. Unfortunately, I must end here, as that is an entire topic in itself. I thank the Samuel Griffith Society, Xavier Boffer, and all those who have made tonight possible. Watch this space. I suspect the Commonwealth will need to pursue other measures to protect our interests against foreign interference. Thank you.